This Sunday's verse comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Verse 28. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These words are spoken to the people by Jesus after he finished instructing his disciples in chapter 10. When I read this, it is a big sigh of relief. There is so much hope and promise in these three verses. They are simple words, yet they are so effective. They encourage us even in our toughest moments. So verse 28. If anyone knows me, they know that I love Oswald Chambers. I read from his devotional every day, and I love what he has to say. I reference him a lot because he says things I need to hear and maybe something that someone else needs to hear. This is what Oswald Chambers had to say about this verse. Do I really want to get there? I can right now. The questions that truly matter in life are remarkably few, and they are all answered by these words. Come to me. Our Lord's words are not do this or don't do that, but come to me. If I will simply come to Jesus, my real life will be brought into harmony with my real desires. I will actually cease from sin and will find the song of the Lord beginning in my life. Have you ever come to Jesus? Look at the stubbornness of your heart. You would rather do anything than this one simple childlike thing. Come to me. If you really want to experience ceasing from sin, you must come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and he will give you rest. Sometimes we carry so much weight on our shoulders. We carry stuff from work, school, our families. Sometimes carrying all of that weight uh, really makes things hard for us. Heavy burdens here also mean being burdened with sin. Sometimes we become burdened and guilty for the sins we have committed. We think we're the worst person on earth and that nothing or nobody can help us and that we are unforgivable. For some of us, we are afraid we're going to relapse and go back to living the way we did before we came to know God and His grace. Well, if we give all our burdens to Jesus, He promises to give us rest. He will take all of that from us and make us feel a kind of peace and joy that can't even be put into words. He will make us a brand new person by His grace and change our lives. What does Jesus mean by rest? He means the rest of salvation. God promises this to us, and God always keeps His promises. And this is what Oswald Chambers has to say about rest. And I will give you rest. That is, I will sustain you, causing you to stand firm. He is not saying, I will put you to bed, hold your hand, and sing you to sleep. But in essence, he is saying, I will get you out of bed, out of your listlessness and exhaustion, and out of your condition of being half dead while you are still alive. I will penetrate you with the spirit of life, and you will be sustained by the perfection of vital activity. Yet we become so weak and pitiful and talk about suffering, the will of the Lord. Where is the majestic vitality and the power of the Son of God in that? So verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There is no better teacher than Jesus. Jesus is the perfect, perfect example to live as the Father has made us to live. Why should we learn from Jesus? The answer is in verse 29 also. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What is the best way to share Jesus' teaching? Through his word, of course. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16, through, uh, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out of God and profitable for teaching, proof for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Jesus does a lot of teaching in the Gospels. He teaches through parables, and the majority of those can be found in the Gospel of Luke. As a side note, my favorite parable is the parable of the sower, which can be found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. I would like to share the parable but I would encourage you to read the rest of the chapter for the explanation of it so you can get a better understanding of it in case you don't understand what I'm reading here. So here we go. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the earth, on the uh, Sorry, And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. 
spreading since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let any one with ears listen. So like I said, this is my favorite parable, a uh, parable of the sower. I'm not, a, I'm not one to judge, but in my daily life, I can see hints of every type of person described in the parable, just everywhere I go, and I can see myself as well. Uh, my favorite teaching of Jesus was the Sermon on the Mount, uh, also known as uh, the Beatitudes. These can be found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. I want to take a few minutes here and share with you what the Beatitudes are. What are the Beatitudes? The Beatitudes present goals which the child of God wants to realize his own life, but he or she can't do it on their own. The eight Beatitudes are the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount on the meaning and way to true happiness. These teachings reflect the promises uh, reflect the promise made to the chosen people since Abraham. They portray Christ and describe his charity. Moreover, by shedding light on the actions and attitudes and characteristic of the Christian life, they describe the vocation or calling of all the faithful. So Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those who, however great their wealth, dignity, learning, etc., acknowledge that in God's sight they are poor, and realize that their riches come from God. Jesus promises theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because Jesus is the good news of salvation for those that are lost and poor in spirit. We get to the end of our rope and feel empty. We have nowhere else to go. We don't know what to do. The way we have been living and what's going on, we just know we are broken and have tried everything under our own power to solve the problem, but always come up empty. God is always the last person we turn to. It isn't until we get to the end of our rope that we see this clearly. When we realize we are poor in spirit, we also realize that we don't know what to do. Matthew 5, 4 Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The next promise is they shall be comforted. Once they realize they need God and can't do it alone. Mourning, in this case, is in reference to spiritual sorrow, grief for sin, one's own sins, or the sins of others. Christ said to his disciples that the Comforter would be sent. We know him as the Holy Spirit. We also know all miracles performed by Jesus were performed via the Holy Spirit. So once we, uh, once we realize how poor in spirit we are, what's the next emotion? Oh, I'm doomed, I'm hopeless, can I be saved? And the list goes on. What happens is we have that heaviness of heart. It's the beginning of the Holy Spirit convicting a heart. It's at this point some run and some stay. There is only one answer a person can say that will determine whether they stay or not. If they can be humble, they are well on their way. What does being humble mean? Being humble is having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's own, one's own importance. Having humility is telling God that you know that he is in charge and that also ties in with trust. You also trust in the Lord and know without a doubt that he is the answer for everything. Matthew 5.5 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does being meek mean? It means quiet, gentle, and easily imposed on, submissive. The meek are those who bear patiently all the contradictions of life, looking upon them as happening through God's will or by his permission. Those are also meek uh, who are able to uh, master their anger, impatience, or desires for revenge. Being meek calls for absolute humility to be able to admit these things because human nature says, I'm never wrong. When a person humbly admits these things, that the Holy, uh, when a person humbly admits these things, that's the Holy Spirit wow moment. It's called grace. By that grace, we fully understand how stupid we are. We realize we must be humble. Only then can a person truly be meek. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which... Do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. This refers to those who have such a strong desire toward the things of God, truth and perfect virtue, as well as those who try to become better, more humble and pure, and more closely united with God. When the Holy Spirit convicts your heart, you will feel hungry inside. Your answer to the Lord will be, I want more. When you crave the Lord and want to be fed, the Lord will never let your plate get empty. Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We don't obtain mercy by works of righteousness or by doing good things. 
We obtain mercy because we have been shown mercy by the Lord. Therefore, we need to be merciful to others. We need to humble ourselves and say, Dear God, help me. By being shown grace and having our hunger, f hunger for his righteousness filled, only then do we fully understand what mercy is in the sense God wants us to know it. It is by the gospel of God executed by his Son do we know what priceless mercy we have been shown. Therefore, we in turn are now equipped to do his work because we know how to extend mercy. True mercy is not to judge another based on who or what they are, what sins they have committed, uh, but only to let them know that God loves them and all will be well. Matthew 5, 8 Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Confession is so important. A lot of people are scared of it. A lot of people don't want to do it. A lot of people don't understand the point of it. But only by doing so can somebody truly be pure of heart to the extent God is looking for. Your salvation is intact once you do this. Look at the promise in the verse. You're going to see God after you die. The reason why we are able to go to confession and be forgiven in the first place is because Jesus Christ suffered and died for our sins and rose again. He loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. Matthew 5, nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So what is a peacemaker in the sense this verse by the Master is speaking of? The turmoil a person brings on themselves by the strongholds they allow in their lives, um, you can show them the path to peace. Situation that, uh, situations that once baffled us, we will intuitively know how to handle. You can be made a real soldier and servant of God by doing a few simple things. People, uh, people that say all this is too hard. What makes it hard is the willingness people exert by resisting doing some very simple things. All these things require a person to completely rid themselves of fear and pride. Matthew 5:10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for there is the kingdom of uh, there is the kingdom of heaven. Being persecuted is being subject to hostility and ill treatment, especially because of their race or political or religious beliefs. Sometimes it's not always the easiest thing to do. If we do anything in the name of the Lord and for his sake, we will receive the kingdom of heaven, meaning we will be rewarded when he calls us up to him. So back to Matthew 11, verse 30. It says, For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What does Jesus mean by this? What makes Jesus' yoke easy and his burden light is that in Jesus' own active obedience, for example, his perfect fulfillment of the law of God, he carried the burden that we were meant to carry. His perfect obedience is applied to us through faith, just as his righteousness we exchange for our sin at the cross. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our obedience to Jesus then becomes our spiritual worship. Romans 12.1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Furthermore, we are consumed by the Holy Spirit who works in our lives to mold us into the image of Christ, thereby making the yoke of Jesus easy and his burden light. The life lived by faith is a much lighter yoke and a much easier burden to carry than the heavy and burdensome yoke of self-righteousness under which we continually strive to make ourselves acceptable to God through works.